grateful to the general and his staff for being here today. And I know that we have a very large group uh, online with us uh, attending virtually. And I'm very grateful to all of you and to the remarkable students uh, who have really put this event and this competition together. Congratulations. This is the sixth uh, of this kind that we have held uh, at Columbia University, and we're really excited to welcome all of you today. And part of what makes this so very special is that it allows a, a really unique opportunity for our students to interact with experts and high level cyber professionals and to engage in really very cutting edge frontier questions uh, involving uh, cyber uh, attacks and conflict. This year, we have an astonishingly uh, a real leader. Uh, uh, and so I feel extremely fortunate that General John Raymond, Chief of Operations and the US Space Force is with us. Thank you so much you, for being here and kicking off our special event. Let me just briefly say, I hope you have seen uh, his extraordinary bio. As Chief of the Space Force, General Raymond has oversight of the newest branch of the armed forces, which was established in December 2019 to protect US and allied interests in space and to provide space capabilities to the Joint Force. He has a long and distinguished career in the military, com commanding at the squadron group wing, major command and combatant command levels. And prior to leading the Space Force, General Raymond had a number of notable staff assignments and led the reestablishment of the US Space Command as its 11th combatant command. I also note that he spent some time in Japan at a critical time after uh, the tsunami. We're honored to have him with us and look forward to his address. Uh, I'd like to note that today's discussion is taking place under Chatham House rules, which means that comments are not for attribution. Before we begin, let me also thank the Atlantic Council as well as SIPA's Digital and Cyber Group for all the hard work that went into organizing uh, today's event. Please join me in thanking and welcoming General Wayne. Thank you very much. Let me just make sure everybody can hear. Can you hear me? Great. Uh, Dean, thank you uh, for the real privilege of being here. Um, it's a highlight of my trip to New York to, to be here and get a chance to spend time with, with young professionals uh, that are steeped in this business, doing great work for, uh, to, to educate yourself, but also uh, to help solve some of the, the really tough challenges that, that, that we face today, as you know, as you, as you complete your study. Um, I'd like to congratulate uh, the team that's put that put on the Cyber uh, 912 Challenge. I, I've had the opportunity over the last couple of days to review um, what the challenge was about, and uh, it, it even made me more excited to be here. Um, as I looked at the challenge, uh, I was both concerned and comforted. I guess I would say I was concerned because really what you're doing is laying out scenarios that are realistic today and that, that uh, could have an impact uh, on our ability to provide security for our nation. And I'm comforted because um, you're helping us think through this. You're helping better yourself. You're helping educate yourself. I know most of you, if not all, uh, want to go on into a career of policy types of things, probably in the cyber uh, area. Uh, and hopefully in the space and cyber area, uh, we can use your talent and, and what you learn here today. And, and I know as part of the challenge, I have several of my uh, team uh, that are gonna be judges, uh, but part of this is we also wanna learn from you and, and learn from uh, what you uncover as you go through this. And uh, again, so first of all, thank you. It was great to get the chance to spend time with some of you. I, I look forward, what I thought I'd do is spend uh, a few minutes kind of priming the pump, if you will, for questions. And I'd really love to have a, a robust dialogue uh, with each of you. And I know we have a group that are linking in online as well. Um, and so I would, uh, I know there's a way for you to chat in questions, but I, I, I don't bite and, and I really would like to, 
to engage in a, in a dialogue. So first of all, let me just talk about uh, the importance of space. You know, the average person in the United States uh, probably doesn't understand just how reliant their data is on space capabilities. Um, it's hard to. It, it's it's a, a domain that you it's not tangible. Uh, you, you you know you can go out at night sometimes and get see some satellites that that are whizzing by, but for the most part, you can't see it. You can't touch it. Uh, we have a saying, as I said a little bit earlier, that satellites don't have a mother. Uh, it's hard to have this relationship. Uh, but trust me, and that uh, every single American on the planet has a relationship with space capabilities, and, and you use space capabilities. Um, probably several times before you even have your first cup of coffee. If you use your smartphone, uh, you're using space. Your smartphone would be called a stupid phone if, without space. And so uh, I think about what, are, you know, the, the capabilities that we operate uh, for weather uh, forecasting, if you will, uh, for precision navigation and timing. The timing signal that comes off a of GPS uh, really is the synchronizer of this information age that, that we live in. And so every single person uh, on, on, in the United States uh, has this connection um, and uh, it, it's real, but people don't understand that in, in the way that they need to. Um, space is changing. Uh, in fact, here, I think in the next couple of days, uh, we are about to launch, when we say we, like the country, is about to launch our 600th person into space to go into the ISS, 600th person. Uh, and that was always in the past great power competition. The only great powers did that, uh, launching humans uh, in, into space. Well, last, what, a month or so ago, four uh, commercial astronauts went into to orbit and spent three days on orbit, uh, four, four commercial. In fact, I got to have dinner last night uh, at a function here in New York with, with the commander of that crew, uh, Jared, Jared Isaacman. And so just think about that, where you have, you know, what used to be great power competition now going down to individuals, what used to be great power competition now being done by students. Uh, and so as barriers to entry to space are reduced, as launch costs go down, as smaller satellites become more relevant, space opens up uh, to everybody. And that's going to be uh, significantly uh, advantageous to our nation and to the world. It, uh, space, again, underpins every instrument of national power, there's diplomatic information, military, uh, economic, talk about a, a trillion dollar economy between here and the earth and the lunar surface uh, uh, here over the next, you know, over the next decade or so. Um, if you lost GPS, which is a, a capability that the Space Force operates free of charge for the world. If you lost that, between the estimates are that it would cost our economy a billion to a billion and a half every single day. Uh, similarly, without space, our military uh, capabilities would look more like uh, the capabilities of our grandparents in World War II, my grandparents in World War II, your great grandparents are great, great, I'm getting old. Uh, uh, but uh, space uh, provides us a significant, significant uh, advantage. Um, back in Desert Storm in, in 1991, uh, which some call the first space war, it was, it was the first time, I don't think it was the first space war, I think the Cold War was the first space war, but uh, it was the first war where we took strategic information from, information from, from strategic satellites and integrated them into operations around the globe. Uh, we saw the first uh, use of precision weapons. We saw us use missile warning satellites to detect, uh, which were designed to detect big intercontinental ballistic missiles detecting SCUD missiles. Uh, we saw a left hook through the featureless terrain of a desert at night without street signs telling where you were. Well, how do you do that? You did that with GPS. Um, so we, we, we saw the value that that provided and almost my entire career almost my entire career was spent integrating space capabilities in, into that theater operations. And we became really good at it. And there's nothing we do from humanitarian assistance to disaster relief. As uh, your Dean said, I had the opportunity to serve in Japan when uh, the great earthquake and tsunami and nuclear reactor disaster happened in uh, March of 2011. 
Uh, and in that humanitarian assistance, disaster relief operations, we use space. I've also deployed into the CENTCOM AOR and have used uh, and made sure that space capabilities were available to, to our military forces in combat. That whole spectrum, we, re we rely on space. The challenge is that our adversaries have had a front row seat or competitors or challengers uh, have had a front row seat and have watched us integrate space to great advantage. And to be honest, they don't like what they see because they see what that does for us. It sees the advantage that that provides. And they're rapidly doing two things. First of all, they're developing space capabilities for their own use, a pretty robust architecture for their own use of space capabilities. And so, uh, God forbid if deterrence were to fail, and I want to want to foot stomp this as a really critical point. Our goal is to never get into a conflict that begins or extends in the space. We want to deter that from happening. Uh, but if deterrence were to fail, uh, and we were to get into a conflict with a spacefaring uh, competitor, uh, they're going to have the same advantage that we have by integrating space into their operations. The second thing that they're doing which is uh, equally concerning, is they're developing weapons to deny us our use of space. And so everything from reversible jamming of GPS satellites and communication satellites to directed energy threats, think uh, lasers that can dazzle or, or blind uh, our satellites, or satellites that are on orbit um, that are designed to uh, hamper or destroy U.S. satellites, like a satellite that China has on orbit with a robotic arm, or a satellite that Russia had on orbit uh, uh, that I describe as a nesting doll satellite. We all have seen the dolls inside of a doll inside of a doll. Well, they have a satellite inside of a satellite inside of a satellite. And so they launch that, the satellite opens up, another satellite comes out, and it opens up and a projectile comes out designed to, to hit and kill a U.S. satellite. Uh, they launched that in 2017, and they launched that again in 2019. And what was different in 2019, they put it up in proximity to a U.S. satellite. And so we, they opened up the satellite, the second satellite came out, and we started talking about it. Say, hey, this is not safe and responsible behavior. And so I don't know if it was a result of our talking about it, but they moved away from our satellite and sent the projectile into a space that, that uh, wasn't around another, another satellite. Uh, there's cyber threats, and that's why this work that you're doing is so important. If you look at space, it's not just about the satellite, it's the satellite, the ground infrastructure, and the link between uh, that, that we have to protect. And uh, there are cyber threats, uh, and we're doing a lot of work in the Department of Defense and specifically in the Space Force to understand the cyber terrain of space. And, and we've embedded cyber operators onto our operational crews to better be able to work through any potential um, issues that might arise from a cyber event. Um, we've, got, we've built cyber protection teams to be able to, to, to protect and defend our space capabilities. Um, and so uh, uh, it, it's a big focus area for us. And that's why I'm, again, not to, not to uh, keep repeating, but that's why it is so important uh, the work that you're doing and it's, and it's why I'm so happy to, to be able to participate today. So while we've entered into the second uh, golden age of space and you think about it, you have commercial space that's just going, I use this word and it's not a great word to use in the space business, just this explosion of, of activity in space. Uh, uh, and it's, it's incredible what's, what's happening in the commercial space business. And then you have civil space, think NASA that does exploration and you've got NASA uh, you know, going back to the to the moon uh, with a goal here in the in the uh, mid twenties, and then on to uh, on to Mars in the future. Uh, you, you think about uh, what's happening on military space with the establishment of the space force. In every sector, there's an incredible growth. Uh, and again, our primary purpose is to keep that domain safe. You can, it's almost analogous to the maritime forces keeping sea lines of communication safe on the oceans. We want to keep that domain safe. So. Uh, economies can thrive, so our military can thrive, so our, our positioning in the, in the world order can, can thrive, or diplomatic uh, um, uh, power. And, and again, space has a, has a piece of that. Um, our, our pacing challenge, if you will, is China. 
and, and, and China is, has moved very, very fast. Uh, they, I describe it going from zero to 60 uh, at incredible speeds. Um, back in the mid nineties, early to mid nineties, uh, China really didn't have a space program. They, they were really having trouble just launching rockets and getting satellites on orbit. Uh, today, they've got a very robust uh, space program. You know, China has invested heavily and demonstrated tremendous technical prowess in space operations. They have rovers on the moon and Mars. Uh, they've resumed uh, returned samples back from the, from the moon. And while they're not at, at parity with us yet uh, in, in terms of capabilities, uh, they're very close and they're, and they're catching up fast. And that's why the United States took an opportunity before there was a crisis to establish the Space Force so we could uh, move at speed, partner with international partners, partner with commercial industry, move to a digital service, build this service from the ground up with a clean sheet of paper uh, for a service custom built for today in the domain that we operate in and the environment uh, that we operate in today to remain the best in the world in space and keep that, that advantage to our nation, which is so important. Um, if you look at uh, if deterrence were to fail, what a conflict in space might look like? Well, one, it won't be what it looks like previously. It's gonna occur across vast distances. Just think of the domain of space and how big that is. The, the AOR, the space AOR assigned to US Space Command is a hundred kilometers above the Earth's surface and out. That's huge. And, th and operations in space happen at a speed that uh, you have to go 17,500 miles an hour just to stay in space. You, you re-enter if you're going slower than that. And so the speed and distance of operations and the ability to attribute actions in space because of speed and, and size uh, of the domain are gonna make it even tougher. And I'm convinced, again, if deterrence were to fail and conflict were to begin or extend uh, into space, uh, it probably will begin in space or cyber because it is harder to attribute. Uh, uh, going forward. So what are we doing about it in, in the Space Force? Well, first of all, uh, since uh, December of uh, 2019, uh, we have been establishing the Space Force. And I, I'm very proud of my Air Force legacy. I, I've been in the Air Force for, I was in the Air Force for 35 and a half years. I got commissioned back in 1984. Um, I have grown up and pretty much done every job in the Air Force that you could do in space. And in 2019, I was the Air Force commander responsible for space inside of the Air Force. And, and that night on 20th of December, when the National Defense Authorization Act was signed, um, after years and decades of debate about an independent service, and after years of studying uh, the, sur the, the different options, the law was signed that bipartisan support of Congress passed that established the Space Force. And on that night, uh, a document that was signed that said, basically, General Raymond is given the boot out of the Air Force and you're now in the Space Force. And uh, you're gonna lead, you're gonna be the CSO, the Chief of Space Operations. And from that day, from 20 December until today, uh, we have been at a full sprint to build this service, to stay ahead of this threat, remain the best in the world. And again, do it with taking a clean sheet of paper. Uh, I've told my team we have two risks. The first risk is we don't think bold enough, that all we do is iterate and we just are basically doing the same thing that we were doing in 2018. Uh, the second risk is when we do think bold, you have to get the bureaucracy to, you have to work it through the bureaucracy to get approval to do it. And in both cases, uh, we have been bold and we've been successful at getting the bureaucracy uh, uh, to, to help us move forward. We want to be uh, in some ways, a disruptive innovator for the Department of Defense as well. To hey, you can, in a small service like us, you can try something, we can make a decision, we can move out, and if it doesn't work, we'll, we'll go back. And you can do it without breaking the National Treasury because space, although every taxpayer dollar is critical, space represents two, two and a half percent of the entire DOD budget. And for that two and a half percent, space is an incredible deal for our nation. Uh, every one of the other services, force structure, is built around access to space. And so you think about World War II, and in a bombing run, a bombing mission in World War II, we'd have a thousand bombers with nine bombs on each bomber, 9,000 bombs going after a city. 
Uh, we'd have for a ball bearing factory, 300 bombers with nine bombs on each bomber going after one target. And on a good day with the world's best air force, about a hundred bombs would hit within a, a mile or so of the target. Today, one bomber takes off with many, many weapons and with precision, everyone is dropped as a perfect strike. How do we do that? We do that by integrating GPS into that. Well, what if GPS wasn't there? I'll ask a, a question. Do we have a thousand bombers in our Air Force? I can tell you the answer is no. Uh, and so it's a space is a huge force multiplier. And it, uh, is, it, it is much cheaper to protect and defend space, to bring our partners in, to develop these global partnerships, to in, enhance our ability to deter uh, than trying to robust all these other services to operate without that integration of space. And so that's what we're focused on. I'm proud of the team. We've got about a little over 6,600 active duty guardians in the Space Force today. We have a, an equal number of civilians. Um, we've, uh, we operate all the capabilities uh, that you rely on each and every day uh, seamlessly. Um, uh, and now we're in the business also of, of protecting and defending those capabilities uh, from a uh, uh, a, a growing threat. I hope that is enough to get the juices pumping and, uh, and uh, uh, prime the pump for some questions. And like I said, I, I really hope uh, to have a great back and forth dialogue with you. I really, really appreciate the opportunity to be here. I'm proud of you. I'm jealous of you. I wish I, wish, I, wish I was as smart as you were back uh, when I was younger and had the ability to go to uh, a school like this and our nation's gonna be well served uh, by you when you graduate, I think some of you here just in another semester and, and move on to, to really important work for our nation. So thank you very much. And again, look forward to the, the dialogue. Let's turn to some uh, both students here and online. Um, and I guess if I may, could you say a little bit more, you, you mentioned uh, Russia, you mentioned China, but could you say a little bit more of what you perceive to be the most imminent threats in space? It's a, there's all kinds of threats in space. Uh, space is a pretty uh, hostile environment to, to, to be in. Uh, even without a man-made threat, uh, there's environmental threats that you have to protect against. Uh, with the amount of, of objects that are in space, space is very congested. Uh, and so you have to protect against things colliding into each other. We had that happen back in 2000. Two satellites collided, caused 3,000 pieces of debris. And so you have to protect against that. Uh, and then there's this man-made or purpose-built threat. That's uh, everything from reversible jamming, as I said, to kinetic destruction. On the reversible jamming side, uh, that's not all that hard to do. You, you could go, I, I'd ask you not to, uh, but you could go on the internet. Anyways, uh, you could go on the internet and, uh, and buy a GPS jammer. Uh, and so reversible jamming is, is um, there's a lower barrier to, entry to, to those types. The higher end uh, threats, Missiles that can launch from the ground and blow up satellites are, are tend to be more for the higher end threats. Uh, we're concerned about all of them because uh, we want to make sure that that our nation can can use it. Much attention uh, in the newspapers to the Chinese testing of a hypersonic missile. Um, and this community uh, that. You know, this was uh, occurring at a, ahead of what we thought their capabilities to be. Do you see that as a, a concern from a space perspective? Uh, absolutely. Just uh, you know, um, contextually, you know, I get asked a lot, "What keeps you awake at night?" And what what keeps me awake at night is uh, the speed at which China is moving. And and what keeps me awake at night is. Um, the slowness in which we are moving. And so let me give you an example. Back in, 
the 50s, when we were first developing the space program, we were building an intercontinental ballistic missile program. And there was a gentleman named General Bernard Schriever. And General Schriever uh, pulled a team of people together. And again, this was, this was Cold War US versus Soviet Union. Uh, and in five years, they had designed, built, uh, and implemented, operationalized the intercontinental ballistic missile system that we basically have today. Five years. Let's pretend that you're a GPS satellite and you're up at in medium earth orbit uh, providing precision and timing data to our country and I wanna buy another one of you. Exactly like you, no change. How long does that take? Anybody guess? I just wanna buy another one of you. Five years to buy a clone of something that already exists. Look at commercial industry. Commercial industry is moving really, really fast. And I would bet on US commercial industry any day. They, they're, they're incredibly innovative. Uh, um, they have a different business model that they're using. One of the things that we wanna do in the Space Force is to be able to, to develop that intersection, public-private uh, intersection, to allow our really high-end uh, technologists married up with commercial that can go fast to allow us to change the business model. The challenge that we have is if, if our business model today is, is to launch a very exquisite satellite, it's the, they're the world's best. It's unbelievable what these satellites can do. And they're very big and they're very small in number because they're expensive. And um, uh, because they're expensive, you wanna make sure that when you launch them that they work. Because it's not like in other, you know, if you were build a car and you drove it down the street and you got a flat tire or whatever, you just pull over and change the tire. You can't do that in space. If, if it doesn't work, you're done. And so you 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 want to make sure because they're so critical to our national security and because um, there's a, they're they're not they're not cheap. Um, you want to make sure that they work, and that drives a business model that that works well for us in a peaceful, benign domain without a threat. But if you're in a domain that's uh, a war fighting domain, uh, that there is a threat, uh, we have to move at speed. And so where business is headed is an assembly line approach. And if a satellite comes off of an assembly line and it doesn't work, it doesn't matter because another one's coming off in an hour, two hours a day. And so it changes the way you think. Uh, and so we're really looking to, again, I think where we'll land is kind of a hybrid. We, we're, our nation's gonna require some really exquisite stuff but I think there's also this new emerging market uh, where we can have operationally good enough uh, satellites that allows us to move at speed, helps complicate uh, the calculus of, a, of an adversary uh, and provides us uh, capabilities that, we're, that we need. You mentioned in your remarks uh, the importance of partnerships yes, and you've alluded now to the importance of industry as, as a driver of innovation. Right. So uh, as you have uh, had this unique moment to build this new capacity, right. how do you bring those elements together to, to, to even do better, if you will? Yeah. Uh, we, we've long uh, relied on industry to provide capabilities for us. I mean, that we, um, what we're trying to do is, is um, do it in a little different way. And one of the things that we wanna do is have a conversation earlier with industry in the process. And so typically uh, what we do is we, we study and we build all the requirements on what this satellite will have to do. And then we drop the stack of requirements documents on the on a contractor that wins the contract. And we say, build this. And, it, and oh, but, oh, by the way, build it and make sure it works because we don't get a do-over. What we wanna do uh, a little differently is go to industry early on and say, here's what, what we need. Here's what we're thinking. Here's the environment that it, the satellite's gonna have to work in. Here is our view of what a, a force design would look like and not just do it on a piece of paper, but actually do it in digital engineering and models and give it to them really and say, what do you think and how would you do business? How would you tackle this challenge? Uh, and so we wanna have that conversation earlier. We did that for the first time 
this past week after a year's worth of work of doing all the modeling and simulation and coding uh, we we had a big meeting with industry brought in 184 different companies and said here it is uh, now uh, tell us where we're wrong tell us where you think we've got this wrong and if you want to we'd encourage you to tell us and and then we'll evaluate that make update our models and then once that's done and then we go on to and we award a contract uh, we then have a a better product, a better foundation of what, what we think we want to do. And then we give them that in digital requirements. And then you can, and I'm not an expert at this, but you can then digitally engineer this uh, satellite and use that same digital thread. And then you can digitally test that satellite. And then we can use that also to build uh, simulators and trainers that our operators can operate and train on. And so you get this digital thread from design to requirements, to acquiring, to testing, to acquisition and you can do that loop a lot faster. That's what we're trying to get out for. Thank you. Let me ask you a couple more questions then open it up. Um, uh, there's been much attention to creating digital services capacity to be a digital right. service. And right. you just mentioned that. So tell us a little bit about what that means in terms of how the talent you need as right. well as, as the strategy. That's one of the things I, I think uh, is most exciting about what we're doing in the Space Force. And every time I go talk to young folks, uh, they really light up when I say this. We, we want to raise the, the digital fluency of our force. And I am a digital dinosaur. I went to Clemson and I graduated in 1984. The first time I saw a computer with a mouse, I was in summer school between my junior and senior year. Think about that. We would type uh, on punch cards. And you'd have a stack of punch cards this thick and you'd put them in a hopper and you go through the hopper and then these big, huge, you know, computer paper things would chunk, 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 chunk. and, you know, uh, a pumpkin would turn, you know, it would design a thing that draws a pumpkin and a pumpkin would be there. And a cyber attack back then was when your college roommate, you know, mixed up your deck of cards and the pumpkin, you know, came out looking like something else. Uh, <laughs> so I am not, that's, that's how I grew up. That's, that's, uh, and so, but there is incredible power in having uh, software focused uh, folks, uh, and especially in the space domain, where I mentioned earlier to a few, you don't experience this domain in person unless you're an astronaut. Uh, I just said 600 people have gone to the International Space Station. There's not, that's not a lot. Everybody else experiences space through data. And so we really believe that this is going to be at the core of our success. A lot of our challenges are big data challenges. And so we really believe that, that this, is, uh, this is going to be important to us as we move forward. And so we've built, uh, given everybody licenses to attend digital university, we built uh, uh, courses to raise everybody's fluency uh, in, in digital. Uh, I'll give you another example. When I was in Japan, radiation uh, because the nuclear reactor disaster, there was low level radiation that was being dis dispersed across the country. And we were, we had tools to measure radiation dispersal, but we didn't have a way to build a common operating picture and display it. And it was causing challenges. We, you know, we, between the services, between us and Japan, between uh, Japan and, and Washington, D.C., just to get a common understanding of where, what radiation and where is it. And we were really struggling with it. And so I said, I wonder how Google would do it. And so I, I picked up the phone and I called Google. And I said, dear Google, this is General Raymond. I'm in, I'm in Japan. <laughs> you found a person. Good I found for person. you. <laughs> and here's the challenge. I need to know how you do it. And I said, well, uh, we'd love to help you. In fact, there's Google Tokyo. They've got hundreds of people that are working around the clock there that are wanting to contribute to saving their nation and, and go chat with them. So I literally hung up the phone, walked across the street, got in a helicopter, flew 30 miles to Tokyo. Uh, and in Rapungi, which is where, right where I landed, a big, huge high rise building, walked across the street, got an elevator, went upstairs, two guys met me with laptops. Here again, this is the digital dinosaur coming into Google. And I'm in a white room with a table and they open up their laptops and I said, here's what I'm trying to do. 
how would you do it? They start typing away and they, they say, well, let's get, I'm making this up, Mary from wherever. She appears on the wall and uh, they start talking. And in about 20 minutes, they say, how about this? I said, man, I, that is perfect. How, how did you do that? And how would I do that? And they said, well, do you know somebody, do you have anybody that knows the computer language Python? I had no clue what Python was, never heard of it before. And I said, what's, well, they said, do you have, know anybody that knows Python? I said, well, what's Python? They said, it's computer language. I said, I don't know, but I'll find out. Flew back to Tokyo or back to the base I was at in Tokyo, put out an all call across the forces in Japan saying, do we know, anybody here know Python? And there was two people. A first lieutenant that was stationed at the same base I was at, and a brand new airman who had just come in the Air Force who was stationed in Okinawa. Uh, we sent a plane down to Okinawa to get this young airman. He was the most strategically important airman in the United States Air Force on that day. And he shows up, and it's a funny story, he shows up with like 40 pounds of suitcases to get on the airplane. And there was rules back then for this type of airplane passengers could only have 35 pounds and they sent him home and i said hey where is this guy and i said sir he, he left and i said listen he he can bring everything he owns on this plane this plane is his plane we just need to get him up here so he can and so this lieutenant and this this airman next day go down to google figure out how to do it and we were up and running in about two days two or three days uh that showed me the value of this and uh and that's what we're trying to build towards very good very good. The, um, well, I should say that we have a high degree of technical capacity in our public policy students here. Mm -hmm. I think it's become a baseline um, that is permeated across uh, many, many disciplines. Let me pick up one more question before going to our students online. Um, you made a reference to the connection to the ground um, in thinking about vulnerabilities. And, and I wonder if you could say a bit more about that. When I think of the communications, navigation, all of these are managed from the ground. So when you think of the interruptions from cyber attack, how do you create a, appropriate defense capabilities around that problem? Yeah. So there's nothing we do in space largely for space sake. Space are big, satellites are big computers that provide information to the ground. That's why we, we send them up there. And so any impact on those satellites have a significant impact on day-to-day -day life or on, on uh, joint and coalition operations. And in fact, because the field of view of a space satellite is so large, if you have a satellite in geosynchronous orbit, 22,000 nautic miles high, it covers about a third of the globe. So if there's an outage there, a significant swath of the planet loses that capability. It's critical that we protect it. And so what we've done is we are we have cyber, the, the career fields that we brought into the Space Force are space operators, intelligence professionals, engineers, acquisition professionals and cyber professionals. And the reason why we brought those in, all those career fields are critical to our ability to, to operate in space and to protect and defend in space. And so we, we have trained cyber operators that we, that we build into teams and we place, we co-locate them with our operational units. And we say, you go understand the cyber terrain of that space capability. And that's not just the satellite portion, it's the the link and the ground segment as well. And then uh, uh, your job day to day is to make sure that, that that is safe and protected from cyber. And that if there is uh, cyber intrusion that we identify it and we, we resolve it quickly. So it's a significant uh, significant challenge for us, uh, but we've, we've uh, increased the training where folks in, organized them and embedded them with our operational units, embedded them with our acquisition units to make sure that we acquire uh, capabilities that uh, have the necessary cyber protection uh, pieces in it. And then we, we keep a watchful eye on the cyber train to make sure that we're safe. Thank you very much. Um, I, you know, the Biden administration in May introduced a new executive order around cybersecurity. Does that 
do you feel the effects of that? It, it's, it's a zero trust environment, or is that so much already what you do that that is really other well, parts of the government? You know, cyber is is systemic into everything that we do, and so uh, it, it it's something that we keep close eye on day to day. And when new uh, executive orders comes out that strengthens that, it's we, you know we adopt those and, and move forward as well. But it's something we take seriously. And again, there's, I say there's nothing we do as a joint force that isn't enabled by space. There's nothing we do as a joint force that isn't enabled by cyber as well. And so everything that we have uh, runs, you know, cyber runs through it. Thank you very much. May I invite uh, those tracking uh, the incoming questions to please uh, start with the uh, offer a question. Hello, hope everyone can hear me. Uh, thank you, General Raymond so much. So quick question from uh, former Columbia SEPA student, Louis Sharvers, who's now back in Germany. Um, and the, we had a similar conversation just as policy students thinking about governance, particularly in cyberspace, but you mentioned responsible behavior in space as well. What is US Space Force's role in governance in space and you know, parallel conversations occurring within the UN or intermilitary dialogue or dialogue with other space programs as well? And is that effective or, or are there are effective alternatives that you see as better options? Yeah, so first of all, uh, thanks. Yeah, basically, it basically said, uh, the question was basically, what is the Space Force's role in policy discussions uh, uh, concerning uh, uh, governance, governance, governance yeah. of, of the space domain and cyber domain. And, yeah. uh, we, we have a, you know, first of all, because the question's from Germany, we, we have a strong uh, partnership base and, and it's largely Australia, uh, New Zealand, the UK, Canada, France, Germany, and Japan. Those are our, 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 part, our strongest partners in space. And we have lots of partners with other emerging uh, space uh, countries as well, but those, those uh, seven are, are, are primary partners. And one of the things that we do is that we uh, war game together, we train together, we exercise together, um, we operate capabilities together. And one of the things that we're thinking about are these policy implications, because space has shifted from a a peaceful, benign domain to a warfighting domain. And with that, everything, the, the, everything changes. How you train your people, um, uh, the types of systems that you launch, the partnerships that you have, uh, norms of behavior uh, on what's safe and professional behavior in the space domain. And so what we're doing with our partners, largely our, our international partners, is to develop what we would consider norms of behavior and operate that way each and every day in space to show the example of here's how responsible nations operate. And if we can do that and demonstrate that responsible behavior, then we can attract others to come our way and operate that same way. We, we're transparent, we share data across the globe. We, we act as the space traffic control for the world, as I mentioned. Um, and so, um, then in the United States, the State Department is the organization that leads the broader, you know, um, uh, norms of behavior work from a nation, and that's and again handled uh, through various uh, organizations, but including the UN and here recently the UK uh, and the US and some others, uh, with the UK leading it, uh, has has put in some uh, UN proposals for safe and professional and and. and norms of behavior. So we help inform that. We help educate in, a, in a, um, the, the discuss or elevate the discussion on that. We help inform our partners of that. We learn from each other. And then our goal is to be able to, to operate that way uh, and, and show others that this is the way uh, responsible nations operate. I'm not naive to think that if you have norms of behavior that all of a sudden everybody's gonna go follow the rules. But it, what it will help us do is identify those that are running the red lights. And uh, so that's what that's kind of our role in, in that effort. Thank you very much. Another question, please, from our online audience. Question from Ned Connolly at, of Johns Hopkins SICE, who is asking, I mean, we've talked a lot about uh, cooperation with the private sector, uh, but you know, the Chinese government has their policy of military-civil fusion. What, how has Space Force thought about 
those ideas and enhancing the coordination with the private sector to potentially counter some of those initiatives. Yeah, as I as I mentioned, uh, I would bet on U.S. industry any day. It's it's the uh, we got incredible industry. They're incredibly innovative. Um, there's a lot of focus right now, and and I feel very lucky. We feel very lucky in the space force to have this industry that's that's exploding. Uh, um, and 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 our goal is to to uh, what I would say have a more fused relationship with them to develop capabilities at speed. So let me give you an example. I can't remember how long ago, it's been 10 months ago or so, I was down at Cape Canaveral getting ready to watch a, uh, a NASA launch of astronauts. Um, it's, a, it's a NASA astronaut going to an international space station, which is a NASA international space station, on board a commercial rocket called SpaceX, mm -hmm. being launched off of a DOD Space Force range. And uh, the astronauts, including a Space Force astronaut, uh, was on that rocket, uh, commanded that, that mission, and made it safely to the International Space Station, uh, provided great science in, uh, while they were on, the or on orbit for six months, and then safely returned. Think about that. Civil, commercial, and military space mm -hmm. all fused together for that mission. We think space provides an opportunity for that. Uh, and, and we want to continue moving down that direction. Thank you. Thank you. That's a wonderful example. Um, any questions from those here or? Uh, yes. Um, yes, ma'am. Please. One of the Cyber 912 teams with several of my teammates here. My question for you is about balance. Is How does about balance? balancing specifically between the existing technologies which are in space or in space related in the space sector, like the ground, uh, the ground facilities that are dated and that have those cyber vulnerabilities that we're talking about, balancing between trying to update those while simultaneously, you know, keep the budget constraints for the space force. As you said, it's a pretty small amount of DOD, but still, um, you said space is very expensive. So that's something that we, um, we definitely talked about is the difference between yeah. trying to update what we have, but also right. keep the budget requirements. It's a great, it's a great question. It's one of uh, <laughs> one of our challenges that, that, as I mentioned, we've got the world's best capabilities today. They're they're exquisite, um, um, but they were really built for a different domain. They were built for a domain without a threat, and so you have to shift to a more defendable architecture and so the challenge that we have is we can't just turn off gps and turn off weather and turn off com and turn off missile warning and turn off space surveillance and turn off isr satellites and say you know uh just sit tight 15 years from now we'll be back with you with all these new stuff and so you gotta you gotta develop a bridging strategy and so what we've done is we've prioritized uh missions and then have begun working the bridging strategy the, the the mission that we prioritized first was the missile warning mission because it provides the unblinking eye 24 7 uh for our nation uh it provides the unblinking eye for our deployed forces in theater as well if you recall uh there was uh attacks uh missile attack from iran into iraq targeting a, an air base that uh where our forces were. That warning was provided by the Space Force and by the satellites. And we were able to provide warning to, to let those uh, deployed personnel take cover or move before they were, and nobody was killed in that attack. Um, that's our highest priority, uh, protecting our nation and our, and, our, and our forces. And so we now have done the work to figure out what that design should look like. We've now started engaging early with commercial industry and with all, not just uh, with, with the entire industrial base, if you will, uh, and said, here's what we're thinking and have that early conversation. And then you have to then work the dollar part of it to make that shift. The good thing that we have is that this, the, these proliferated constellations that are materializing are much cheaper satellites. Uh, the bad part about it is to have persistence, you have to have a lot of them. And so it's going to require us to acquire differently uh, to, to be able to do this without breaking the treasury. 
satellites uh, can be expensive, but satellites can also not be expensive. I mean, there's satellites on the low end, you know, the CubeSats that are, that are, that are very, very uh, inexpensive. And so what we want to do is hit the sweet spot, uh, save some dollars for the, for the, uh, the taxpayer, but increase the ability to conduct the mission and, and create this resilience. But you raise a great point. There's, you gotta, you gotta keep doing what you're doing while you make the shift. And that's the balance that we're in. And we've done it largely through prioritization. Very good. Another yes, question from the front. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, so as you said, commercial industry has increased dramatically um, with a lot of in private investment in an expansion in especially commercial endeavors in space. Um, a lot of those requiring an approval from other entities, not really the Department of Defense as much as so much as the FCC, like thinking of um, Starlink mega constellations that'll, you know, theoretically have over 40,000 satellites in space. Um, and meanwhile, the Space Force being the smallest and newest branch of the military, how do you think about scaling um, with private industry to provide that defense and also, you know, intervening at the right points to ensure that, you know, all those could be a security threat, right, um, in some capacity and in, in, in balancing that and managing that as it grows? Yeah, so the, the cool thing about the Space Force, if you think about the GPS constellation, we operate you know, 30 operational GPS satellites uh, uh, for the world with about 70 or 80 people. That's it. And so it's not, it's not a, um, it, it's not a manpower intensive business. It's a technology intensive business. So you can, you can operate global capabilities with global uh, uh, effects with a relatively small number of people. So it's not just uh, the size of organizations, we don't have to keep up with that. You can do that with, uh, you, you, in fact, we have purposefully, purposefully kept the organization small because we wanted to go fast. And as, as we were designing this force, we got a lot of advice from, from uh, uh, companies that are in the organizational design business. And one of the things I heard across the board was big companies go slow and, and we can't afford to go slow. So we purposefully have kept it small. Um, and so, uh, the, the, uh, the capabilities that, that we are building to have domain awareness uh, of what's in space, uh, we, we continue to, to update that. It's really important to, to have those, uh, to have that awareness and that it's becoming more challenging because as you said, the numbers of satellites are growing and the size of the satellites are, are getting smaller. And so... There's a international space station. Anybody gone to a, a pro baseball game and they have these big t-shirt shooters and they start shoot t-shirts into the, into the stands. Well, they basically have a high tech t-shirt shooter on the international space station that shoots out flocks of satellites. It's hard to, we, and we track all those things and we, we make sure that they don't collide with anything and it's become more challenging. So, the way we're handling that is obviously updating our space domain awareness capabilities, but also developing partnerships uh, with other countries to have domain awareness sharing agreements so they can share with us and we can share back with them. And then our big focus has been on data. And there's a lot of commercial space situational awareness uh, uh, companies that are out there as well that operate capabilities around the globe. And to be able to ingest that data, uh, put it into uh, what we call a, a unified data library that you can then put analytical tools on top of it to help solve and understand what's going on in the domain. So we're, t we're approaching it from a mul from multiple different perspectives, but it doesn't require an army of people. It's it's data and it's um, it, it's te technologies that can be operated with a with a relatively small amount. Our challenge is as we as we want to be small, we want to go fast. You also have to operate inside the bureaucracy of the Department of Defense. And you have to have enough mass there to be able to attend the meetings. Uh, and so, uh, and to be able to interact at, at, you know, at, at the right level. So uh, that's, that's another one of those balance things for us is being small to go fast with enough weight to be successful. I think uh, we have time for one last question from the audience. Um, uh, and 
I, I think I had given yes, the mic yes, to sir. one of our faculty. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm having a really hard time hearing you. My question is about channels of communication with adversary states as opposed to the seven friendlies that you mentioned in your talk. Are there such things? Yeah, they're they're uh, interaction with adversaries. We today yeah. we do not have uh I, we do not. I do not have any personal communications with China or Russia. My counterparts in China, or Russia. I really believe uh, it's something that we should be doing. Um, the way we do communicate uh, as the space traffic controller, if you will, for the world, when we see that two objects might collide, we send notifications to everybody, including the Russian and Chinese, and say, "Hey, you might want to move because something's going to hit." They don't have to listen to me. Uh, but we have a means to send that warning. Uh, but other than that, uh, there hasn't been conversation. It's actually done below my level. There's the option of we communicate on an operation. But if you think about it, in the Cold War, in the height of the Cold War, the space program was a program that we worked well with. Yes. With the Soviet Union. Yes. We, I really believe space provides an opportunity for, for global partners. I mean, today we operate the International Space Station together. In fact, Katie Haig, sitting right back there, my public affairs officer, her husband is a Space Force colonel and a NASA astronaut, launched to the International Space Station on a Russian rocket. Uh, today we don't do that anymore because we brought that back and we're now launching astronauts from US soil, uh, which is a great thing. But there, there, you know, space has provided in our history an opportunity for nations to collaborate, and I think there's value there. Well, thank you. If I may, uh, any last word uh, of advice to our policy students? Uh, study hard. <laughs> <laughs> do, do good. Uh, I'm, I'm excited for you. Uh, I think you know if you are, if you are smart enough to get accepted into this school, and, and uh, and obviously I, I've learned uh, to get into this program, you've done an ad undergraduate and you probably have had a couple years of experience and then come in. So you have a little bit of taste of, of what you wanna do. So you're, you're passionate about this. You come into an, an incredible school like uh, Columbia and, and get the education that this provides you. Uh, there are, and, and focusing on this area, cyber and, and, and connections with space, uh, this is the big growth area for our nation going forward. And so uh, you, you've got a bright future ahead of you. What I would tell you, I guess the advice I would give you is when you graduate from here and you go off into the workplace, don't be bashful, be bold. Uh, I'm the digital dinosaur, you're not. Help us get this right as a nation. Help, put your brains into this and, and help us develop the policies that, that our nation needs and the world needs to be able to to do this well. And there is a lot of thought to be done. And uh, I, I, I'll leave here uh, with an extra bounce in my step knowing that uh, we've got people that uh, are schooled in this and passionate about it. And uh, we'll, we'll go off and do great things for our country and for the world. So thank you. I'm, I'm jealous of you. Well, I want to thank uh, our students for, for bringing us together for the incredible energy you've put into this. Uh, and I want to thank Jason Keeley for having created this challenge in the first instance and running our cyber program at SIPA. And most of all, I want to thank you, General. Thank it's, you, you have so many places to be. We feel yeah. honored you're with us today. Please I'm join me in thanking him for thank being with us. I, uh... I, I, my understanding is the competition is going on right now. Uh -huh. So for those that are competing, uh, good luck. And I look forward to hearing the results of the competition. I've got a few folks from my team that will be uh, part of the judging uh, uh, team. And I look forward to getting uh, inputs from them on, on the insights that you've learned. So thanks again. Thank you.